日本史学習に最高にもってこいのサイトサムライアーカイブスポッドキャストへようこそ美しい自然にあふれてる縄文時代から波乱万丈な幕末まで全時代を網羅して日本史の隅から隅まで一緒に語り合いましょうでは早速日本史の世界へBoy, have I got a story for you. So, if this is your first time listening to the Tales of the Samurai series, kind of like a sub section of the Samurai Archives podcast, you might want to go back and listen to episode one, but it's not required, although it is appreciated. But in that episode, I talk about seppuku, which comes up a little bit in the story of the 47 Ronin. And I might refer to it once or twice in this episode. But anyway, before I get into all that, I just wanted to throw out a huge thank you to the patrons on Patreon. Specifically, patreon.com slash samurai archives. You guys are why I subject myself to the brutalities of this research. So, if you like what you hear today and you want to help out, please check out patreon.com slash samurai archives. Like I said in the、uh, previous Tales of the Samurai podcast episode, it's thanks to you guys that I'm doing this. Now, this isn't just some 25 minute bullshit outline of the 47 Ronin. I could do that, that would just be the audio version of clickbait. And I'm here to show you that I'm not fucking around and we're going deep. I got 40 pages of notes, a full glass of Jack Daniels Tennessee honey whiskey. Ah, sweet Christmas. And before you judge me, I usually take my whiskey neat. I mean, I'm not a barbarian, but、uh, the ice works with the Tennessee honey whiskey. I recommend it. All right. Prepare yourself for a heroic dose of Japanese history. Here. We go. Oh, yeah. So, like I said, I'm going to go through the tale of the 47 Ronin. Start out with the actual, the fictionalized version so that we can all get familiar, get a familiar baseline here. And then we'll figure out, well, what was the real story? What really happened? I'm going to go through the story as it's told over and over in books and movies for the past 300 years. And then go ahead and kick the shit out of it and see what happens. So, my plan this episode is to cover the fictionalized version, look at the facts, see how it all matches up. And next episode, I'll look at the hows and whys of the punishment of the 47 Ronin. I do it all in one podcast, but the sheer volume of information I'm going through is pretty nuts. And this isn't my full time gig, although if we get enough patrons kicking cash in this direction, it will be, so there's that. But anyway, this episode will be the story of the revenge of the 47 Ronin. Next episode, we'll look at the punishment and the 300 years of debate that followed it. And something I want to mention up front is that I'll be throwing around terms like family, clan, and house a lot in this episode, and I'm going to pretty much use them interchangeably. As a non historian, I claim that right. And I know I'm sure there are differences in usage that the Greybeards and the Ivory Tower debate endlessly, but I'm not going to concern myself with that. I don't want to add any more complexity to my plate than I have here already, and I don't want to have to worry about it. So, for my purposes, family, clan, and house, same thing. And with 40 pages of notes to go over, more complexity is not what I need. Also, sometimes I forget that not everyone is hip to the lingo, so Ronin refers to a masterless samurai. The Chinese characters used to write the word Ronin are wave and person. Not wave like waving your hand, but wave like an ocean wave. The idea being that their people cut loose from their master and left adrift in the waves. So, like I've said like three times already, I'm going to start with a traditional fictionalized account that we all know and love. Most of the traditional account that I'll give you is based on Mitford's version of the 47 Ronin story from his book, Tales of Old Japan, as well as other story tidbits taken from other fictional sources. And I don't really want to spend too much time on the kind of the background history surrounding the event, but to give a thumbnail for anyone out there not familiar with 18th century Japan, the wars of unification were over, disco was dead, there had been a relative peace for nearly a century. Uh, aside from a few issues early in the 17th century,、uh, some guy in Osaka Castle had to be dealt with. Some Christians got out of hand, shit like that. But one method of control implemented by the Bakufu, and、uh, the Bakufu is the term 
used to refer to the Tokugawa shogunate. But anyway, one method they used to control the regional daimyo, and daimyo means a regional lord, essentially, was something called sankin kotai, or alternate attendants. So wives, children, and some senior retainers of a daimyo were required to live in the capital of Edo. And every other year or so, the daimyo were required to reside in Edo. It was basically a way to keep centralized control as well as drain daimyo finances, making a big show of traveling back and forth. So you don't want your uh, regional leadership to get too comfortable and too rich. That's when you have problems. So on the 14th day of the third month of 1701, to be exact, Asano Takumi no Kami Naganori, the lord of Ako Domain in Harima province, attacked Kira Kozuke no Suke Yoshinaka, otherwise known as Yoshihisa, in Edo Castle, setting in motion the giant shitstorm that we're about to talk about today. So with that brief introduction, here's the story of the 47 Ronin as it's been told in kabuki plays, books, comic books, and movies for the past 300 years or so. Probably a story you'll recognize, but later on we'll do some fact-checking and see how well it actually holds up. All right, let's rock and roll. Once upon a time in the Orient, Lord Asano Naganori of Ako and Date Muneharu of Yoshida were appointed to receive an imperial envoy at Edo Castle and provide him with a feast. The samurai were very big on proper formalities, so Lord Asano was assigned to Kira Yoshinaka for instruction on the intricacies of proper court etiquette. Kira was a greedy man, and unimpressed with the gifts that Asano and Date had presented him, treated them poorly. Date's rage grew day by day. However, Asano was a patient and honorable man. He bore the insults and embarrassments put on him by Kira. Date at last declared to his retainers that he was going to kill Kira in the castle regardless of consequences, for he could no longer bear the shame put on him by Kira. Unbeknownst to Date, his chief vassal went to Kira and gave him presents and coin on behalf of his lord, telling Kira how much Date Muneharu respected him and appreciated his help. After this, Kira was exceptionally helpful and kind to Date, and so Date stayed his hand and forgave Kira's previous insults. On the other hand, Asano's patience, and presumably lack of a suitable bribe, enraged the shifty and dishonorable Kira. He ramped up his aggressive and insulting behavior, at one point even demanding that Asano tie up his sock for him, then berating him for doing an improper job. Asano was out of patience at last. He pulled his short sword and struck out at Kira. However, Kira's hat deflected the blow. Kira ran, and Asano chased him, striking again but missing and striking a pillar instead. At this moment, Kajikawa Yasube, an officer, rushed up and held back Asano, allowing the despicable Kira to escape. Asano was arrested and confined and was promptly sentenced to death by seppuku for his offense at Edo Castle. By law, his belongings would be confiscated, his house dispossessed, Ako would be confiscated, and his retainers would be scattered to the four winds as ronin. Some ronin would go on to find employ with other daimyo, others would become merchants, but some would have revenge. Asano's principal counselor, Oishi Kuranosuke, who was not at Edo Castle when Asano attacked Kira, built a league of 46 other like-minded former Asano retainers and began plotting revenge. The evil Kira was married to a daughter of the Uesugi clan, and perhaps expecting retribution, surrounded himself with Uesugi men to prevent an attack. Knowing that they would have to be patient in order to catch Kira off guard, Kuranosuke and his men pretended to go on with their lives, some becoming carpenters, others merchants or craftsmen. Kuranosuke moved to Yamashina in Kyoto and appears to give himself up to drunkenness and debauchery, shacking up with harlots and wine-bibbers. It is said that a Satsuma samurai saw Kuranosuke passed out drunk in a Kyoto street one day and insulted him as a craven and faithless beast, spitting on him and kicking him in the face. Word got back to the vile Kira, who was amused and relieved by the news. Kuranosuke's wife was not amused by his dalliances with wine or women either. She told him that he had gone too far in trying to trick Kira, and in response, Kuranosuke divorced her and sent her back to her home with her children. Only his eldest son, Chikara, stayed with him. Kira's spies informed him about Kuranosuke's drunkenness and his tossing out his wife and taking up with a young concubine, and Kira at last began to believe that he had nothing to fear from Kuranosuke. He reduced his number of guards and kept a less strict watch, falling into Kuranosuke's trap. As far as he was concerned, the retainers of Lord Asano were cowards who had moved on. He never imagined that Kuranosuke thought nothing of divorcing his wife and throwing out his children in the name of revenge. Kuranosuke continued his strategy of throwing Kira off with his actions as others of the group of 47 who were employed as carpenters, groundskeepers, peddlers, and builders contrived to gain access to Kira's mansion, allowing them to access the buildings and layout, all the while in continual contact with Kuranosuke. When at last it appeared that Kira was completely off his guard, the 47 noble ronin went into action. 
In the twelfth month of 1702, the 47 ronin had their revenge. Kuronosuke left Kyoto for Edo, avoiding Kira's spies. It was decided that they would attack. The 47 ronin would break into two separate groups, one led by Kuronosuke himself and one led by his son Chikara, who was a mere 16 years of age. Yoshida Chuzaimon was appointed as his guardian. The attack would happen at midnight, and Kuronosuke arranged that a drum would be beaten to single the simultaneous joint attack. And when Kira's head was taken, they would blow a whistle as a signal for everyone to gather. Lastly, they planned to carry the head to Sengakuji Temple to place as an offering before the tomb of their dead lord. After this, they would report their deed to the Bakufu and await the sentence, which they expected would be death. The 47 ronin all pledged themselves to the deed ahead and partook of one last farewell feast together, knowing that the next day they must die. At the feast, Kuronosuke addressed the gathered ronin. Tonight we shall attack our enemy in his palace. His retainers will certainly resist us, and we shall be obliged to kill them. But to slay old men and women and children is a pitiful thing. Therefore, I pray to you, each one, to take great heed, lest you kill a single helpless person. All present applauded their leader, and there they remained, waiting for midnight. Kuronosuke gave each man some coins, so that in the case of failure, money would be found in their bodies, so that they would not be mistaken for robbers. When midnight finally arrived, the ronin headed out into the driving snow. As planned, they split into two groups, one led by Kuronosuke and one led by his son, Chikara. Chikara took 23 men to the back gate of Kira's mansion. Four other men used rope ladders to climb over the main gate into the courtyard and did their best to confirm that the mansion was asleep. They then went to the porter's lodge and captured and tied up the sleeping guards. The guards were terrified and begged for their lives. The ronin asked for keys to the gate, but the guards told them that the keys were kept in the house. The four ronin spared the guards and used a mallet to smash the wooden bolt keeping the gate closed. The gate burst open and Kuronosuke's men poured in, while at the same time Chikara and his men broke through the back gate. Kuronosuke sent a messenger to the neighboring estates with the following message. We, the ronin who were formerly in the service of Asano Takumi no Kami, are this night about to break into the palace of Kozuke no Suke to avenge our lord. We are neither robbers nor ruffians, and no harm will come to your neighboring houses. We pray you to set your minds at rest. Fortunately for the ronin, Kira was hated by his neighbors for his greed and covetousness, so none of the surrounding houses lifted a finger to assist him. As an additional precaution, Kuronosuke stationed ten archers on the roof of the four sides of the courtyard in order to shoot down any retainers who might flee to get help. The moment the messengers left and the archers were in place, Kuronosuke beat his drum to signal the attack. Kuronosuke's group burst through the front doors of the mansion into the front room, where they were confronted with ten of Kira's retainers, who had awakened to the noise and grabbed their swords to defend their master. There was a furious battle, and the ronin bested Kira's men, killing them all without losing a single man. Chikara's men burst through the back entrance of the mansion and met up with Kuronosuke's men, at which point the remainder of Kira's men flooded into the mansion from the barracks outside and chaotic battle ensued. During the melee, Kira fled and hid with his wife and female servants in a closet on the veranda. Kuronosuke shouted orders to his men in the chaos, and Kira's men began to fall back. They tried to send messengers to the neighboring Uesugi household to ask for help, but were shot down by Kuronosuke's archers. Kira's men broke, and the remainder fled or were killed. Kuronosuke ordered his men to Kira's private chambers, where they were met with Kira's three most loyal retainers and expert swordsmen, Kobayashi Heihachi, Waku Hondayu, and Shimizu Ikkaku. The three Kira retainers fought bravely, driving the ronin back, causing Kuronosuke to yell, Did you not swear to lay down your lives in avenging our lord? You let yourselves be driven back by these three men? Cowards, not fit to be spoken to. To die fighting in a master's cause should be the noblest ambition of a retainer. He then turned to his son Chikara and said, Boy, engage those men. If they are too strong for you, die. Chikara grabbed a spear and gave battle to Waku Hondayu, but could not hold his ground. As they fought, he was driven into the garden, where he tripped and fell into a pond. As Hondayu moved in for the kill, Chikara stabbed him in the leg with his spear and then finished him. In the meantime, the other two Kira swordsmen were killed by the other ronin, and Chikara, bloody sword in hand, returned to the mansion, and, finding no trace of Kira, checked a back room, where he came face to face with Kira's son, Sahyoe, brandishing a naginata. They fought, and Chikara got the upper hand, wounding Sahyoe, and Sahyoe escaped. The ronin gathered, and Kuronosuke divided the men into smaller groups, and they began systematically searching the mansion, but all they could find were cowering women and children. They began to lose hope believing that they had somehow let their enemy escape and began talk of committing suicide on the spot. However, 
Kuronosuke went to Kira's bedchamber and, feeling the bedding was still warm, knew that Kira must still be close by. The ronin renewed their search. In an alcove in the room was a hanging picture. One of the ronin pulled it down, revealing a hole in the wall. One of the ronin, Yazama Jutaro, climbed into the hole and found that on the other side was a small courtyard with a shack for holding charcoal and firewood. As he approached the shack, two armed men sprang on him, attempting to cut him down. However, he was able to hold them off until one of his comrades came up and killed one of the men and engaged the other. Yazama entered the shack, and seeing something white in the dark, struck out with his spear. A cry of pain betrayed that it was a man. The man had been wounded in the thigh, and Yazama rushed him. The man drew a knife and feebly swung at Yazama. Yazama struck the knife away and dragged the man out of the shack and dumped him in the courtyard. The other ronin came up and examined the prisoner, and saw that he was a man in his sixties of noble bearing, dressed in a white sleeping robe, stained with blood from his wound. The two ronin asked his name, but the old man was silent. Convinced this was Kira, they gave the signal whistle and all of their comrades collected together. Kurunosuke brought forward a lantern and scanned the old man's features, and observed the scar on his forehead where Lord Asuno had struck him in the castle. There was no mistake, it was indeed Kira Yoshinaka. Kurunosuke got down on his knees and addressed the man respectfully. My lord, we are the retainers of Asano Takumi no Kami. Last year your lordship and our master quarreled in the palace, and our master was sentenced to Harakiri, and his family was ruined. We have come tonight to avenge him, as is the duty of faithful and loyal men. I pray your lordship to acknowledge the justice of our purpose. And now, my lord, we beseech you to perform Harakiri. I myself shall have the honor to act as your second, and when, with all humility, I shall have received your lordship's head, it is my intention to lay it as an offering upon the grave of Asa no Takumi no Kami. And it was thus that in consideration of Kira's rank they treated him with the greatest courtesy, and over and over again entreated him to perform seppuku. However, Kira merely crouched speechless and trembling. At last, Kuranosuke could see that his entreatment was in vain, so he forced Kira to the ground and cut off his head with the very same dagger that Lord Asano had committed seppuku with two years before. The ronin, elated that they had accomplished their task, put Kira's head in a bucket, extinguished all of the lights and fires in the mansion to prevent any accidents that could affect the neighbors, and departed. At this point, the lowest ranking of the 47, Terasaka Kichiemon, was dispatched to Hiroshima to inform Asano's younger brother Nagahiro in person of their success, after which he would return to the ronin. As the rest made their way to Takanawa, the location of the Sengakuji temple, morning came, and people flocked out to see the 47 heroes with their torn and bloody clothes making for a terrible sight. Everyone praised them, in wonder of their valor and faithfulness. At every turn, the ronin expected to be attacked by the Weisugi house, headed by Kira's father-in-law, but the attack never came. Matsudaira Akinokami, whom Kuranosuke had served as a cadet, was very pleased by the news of the attack and had made ready to assist the ronin in case they were attacked. Because of this, the Weisugi declined to pursue them. At about 7 a.m., the ronin came to the residence of another Matsudaira lord, Mutsunokami. Matsudaira, hearing of this, sent for one of his counselors and said, The retainers of Lord Asano have slain their lord's enemy and are passing this way. I cannot sufficiently admire their devotion, so, as they must be tired and hungry after their night's work, do go and invite them to come in here, and set a meal and a cup of wine before them. So the counselor went out and said to Kuranosuke, Sir, I am a counselor of the Prince of Sendai, and my master bids me to beg you, as you must be worn out after all you have undergone, to come in and partake of such poor refreshment as we can offer you. This is my message to you from my lord. I thank you, sir, replied Kuranosuke. It is very good of his lordship to trouble himself to think of us. We shall accept his kindness gratefully. The ronin went into the residence, ate breakfast and drank wine, and all of the retainers of Matsudaira came and praised them. Then Kuranosuke turned to the counselor and said, Sir, we are truly indebted to you for this kind hospitality, but as we have still to hurry to Sengakuji, we must humbly take our leave. And after returning many thanks to their hosts, they left the residence of the Matsudaira and hastened to Sengakuji, where they were met by the abbot of the monastery, who went to the front gate to receive them and led them to the tomb of their lord, Asano Takumi no Kami. And when they came to their lord's grave, they took the head of Kira, and having washed it clean in a well, laid it as an offering before the tomb. When they had done this, they engaged the priests of the temple to come and read prayers while they burnt incense. First Kuranosuke burnt incense, and then his son Chikara, and after them the other men performed the same ceremony. Then Kuranosuke, having given all the money that he had to the abbot, said, when we forty-seven men shall have performed Harakiri, I beg you to bury us decently. I rely upon your kindness. This is but a trifle that I have to offer, such as it is, let it be spent for our souls. And the abbot, 
marveling at the faithful courage of the men, with tears in his eyes, pledged himself to fulfill their wishes. So the ronin, with their minds at rest, waited patiently until they could receive the orders of the government. At last they were summoned, where the officials of Edo and the public censors had assembled, and the sentence was passed upon them as follows. Whereas neither respecting the dignity of our city, nor fearing the government, having leagued yourselves together to slay your enemy, you violently broke into the house of Kira Kozuke no Suke by night and murdered him. The sentence of the court is that, for this audacious conduct, you perform harakiri. When the sentence had been read, the forty-seven ronin were divided into four parties and handed over to the safekeeping of four different daimyo. And officials were sent to the residences of those daimyo in whose presence the ronin were made to perform harakiri. But, as from the beginning, they had all made up their minds that to this end they must come. They met their death nobly, and their corpses were carried to Sengakuji and buried in front of the tomb of their master, Asano Takumi no Kami. And when the fame of this became known abroad, the people flocked to pray at the graves of these faithful forty-seven men. Among those who came to pray was the Satsuma man, who, prostrating himself before the grave of Oishi Kuranosuke, said, When I saw you lying drunk by the roadside at Yamashina in Kyoto, I knew not that you were plotting to avenge your lord. And, thinking you to be a faithless man, I trampled on you and spat in your face as I passed. And now I have come to ask pardon and offer atonement for the insult of last year. With those words, he prostrated himself again before the grave, and, drawing a blade, stabbed himself in the belly and died. And the chief priest of the temple, taking pity upon him, buried him beside the ronin, and his tomb still remains to be seen with those forty-seven comrades. And this is the end of the story of the forty-seven ronin. Or is it? A lot of the facts uh, of the story don't really match up with reality. But, you know, of course they don't. It's a story. And it's a good story. Uh, depending on the medium, it's a damn good story. Or not. I'm looking at you, Keanu. <gasps> but 300 years of dramatic license has changed quite a bit about the story, and every time someone publishes a new comic book based on the 47 Ronin claiming that it's historically accurate, I, I cringe because it ends up being about as historically accurate as Human Centipede was medically accurate. Human Centipede wasn't really medically accurate. The reason for this major fictionalization is uh, that all the modern accounts of the 47 Ronin pretty much came from the play Kanadehon Chu Shingura, written in 1748, which, you know, by the way, is a good 46 years after the fact, so there's that. But uh, Chu Shingura is probably the most, the most famous of these stories. But to kind of give you some background, Chu Shingura, which you'll probably recognize from a zillion different movies, is commonly translated as the Treasury of Loyal Retainers. And it's, you know, the fictionalized account of the 47 Ronin. But the actual word Chushingura, now this is, I found this interesting. It's a, it's a bit of a play on words in Japanese. Chushin is loyalist or loyal retainer. And Gura comes from the Chinese character for warehouse or storehouse or treasury. So you get the treasury of loyal retainers. But the play on words here is that Gura, it, it's actually pronounced Kura on its own. And this Kura phonetically refers to Kura Nosuke, the hero of the story. So... An alternate title could be The Loyalist Kuranosuke, if you follow. It's basically hidden in plain sight, like a lot of things in Kabuki, where you couldn't really comment directly on contemporary events, so you had to pretend you were talking about another historical event, or use a play on words like this to get your point across. But uh, speaking of the uh, Kura storehouse, Marky Star at the Japan This blog recently published an entire article on Japanese storehouses, so for more detail on the concept of the Japanese storehouse, although not directly related to this 47 Ronin incident, it's an interesting part of Japanese culture, so go check it out at uh, his blog at japanthis.com. Okay, so the uh, account I just finished giving you came largely, like I said, from Mitford's Tales of Old Japan, which is, uh, I think it was published in like 1879 or something, but it's uh, available free on the internet, it's out of copyright. And he got the story from the popular retelling based on Kabuki, and uh, you know, not from any sort of historical documents. I also took some information from a translation of a document written in 1744 by Motori Norinaga, which was also kind of a, a fictionalization, or at least it was him recording a telling of the story that he heard. So, and again, that was about 42 years after the fact. But, you know, let's face it, 47 loyal Avengers taking vengeance against a corrupt bureaucrat on behalf of their honorable lord makes for a better story than... The story of a respected court bureaucrat who was attacked for unknown reasons by an incompetent lord and then killed in an 18th century equivalent of a drive-by. But we'll get to all this. To give some clarification 
and some background on the main players before we get into the, the meat of the whole podcast here. Lord Asano Naganori's title was Takumi no Kami. That was like a, a title bestowed upon him. So you'll often see him referred to as such. And Kira Yoshinaka's title was Kozuke no Suke, And you'll usually see him referred to as such. And uh, he was also otherwise known as Yoshihisa. But traditionally in the story, he's known as Yoshinaka. So that's kind of what I stuck with. But kind of seems that the consensus nowadays is that he was mainly known as Yoshihisa. But you know, like I said, for simplicity's sake, just stick with Kira Yoshinaka because that's his popular name. As for Asano, he, like I said, he was in Edo for one of his Sunkin Kotai rotations. And this seems to be the reason that he was assigned to Kira for training. He wasn't in Edo enough to know all of the pomp and circumstance required of his role, whereas it seems that Kira was essentially a permanent resident of Edo, and this was his specialty. So who was Asuno Naganori? What do we actually know about him, other than he botched an attempt to kill an unarmed old man in Edo Castle, anyway? Short answer, not a lot. He was the great-grandson of Toyotomi retainer Asuno Nagamasa, who was the brother-in-law of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He was actually married to Hideyoshi's wife's sister and fought in Korea alongside Kato Kiyomasa. Asano Nagamasa eventually sided with the Tokugawa during the Battle of Sekigahara, the battle which helped put the Tokugawa in power, and the choice to side with the Tokugawa benefited the family greatly, with the end result being that Asano Naganori was now the lord of Ako Castle in Harima. Asano is always portrayed as either an outright honorable lord who attacked Kira Yoshinaka due to constant and unbearable insult, or a victim of a greedy noble. But when you look at the contemporary documents, you start to see another side of Naganori. The Dokai Koshuki, which was a document written before the Aku incident, uh, the Aku incident being another term for Asano's attack on Kira and the resulting shitstorm that ensued, describes Asano as intelligent and strict, but, quote, given to pleasure in preference of the sober business of government. And it also mentions that he lacked literary and military skills and, again, I quote, had a considerable sexual appetite and the main means of promotion among his retainers appeared to be their success in obtaining women for him. So he was basically surrounded by ass-kissing lackeys and knob-polishing minions, from what I can tell. Nothing outright damning, I suppose, but it doesn't exactly paint a virtuous picture of our honorable Lord Asano. And it does seem to indicate the failure of his retainers to control and educate their lord on all that was required as a daimyo, which was, of course, their duty as retainers. Naganori lost his father at the age of eight, and it seems that his retainers were a little too busy trying to curry favor and consolidate their own positions of power in the clan to bother with teaching the young lord the things he needed in order to succeed as a daimyo. And this failure on the part of his retainers could be an indication of why he blew it at Edo Castle and was forced to commit seppuku. And I kind of think this paints a pretty poor picture of these 47 ronin, always held up as paragons of virtue in Bushido. You know, another thing to keep in mind here is that all this stuff was revealed in a Bakufu document written before everything went down at Edo Castle. So two points come to mind here. One, there wouldn't be any bias against Asano due to his actions at Edo Castle since this was written before that. And two, obviously you want to put your best foot forward when your superiors are evaluating you in your domain, and Asano couldn't even keep it together for that. The fact that the Bakufu reps who wrote this were able to find out all this negative stuff tells me that Asano was probably pretty terrible at his job, and everyone knew it. But I know you're probably saying, Chris, this, this guy Kira Yoshinaka was such a greedy and insulting asshole, even the most honorable lord would have had trouble controlling himself. Well, first off, I don't know why you're defending him, but that aside, what do we actually know about Kira? The Kira family was descended from Minamoto Yoshie, and Kira Yoshinaka himself was a direct descendant of the first shogun, Tokugawa Ie's first cousin, Kira Yoshisada. So he had Edo street cred anyway. But there's, there's even more to his story. Uh, he was a Hatamoto living in Edo, which basically means he was a high muckety-muck embedded in the Bakufu bureaucracy, and he received a stipend of 4,200 koku as salary for performing his court duties. And koku, as you may or may not know, refers to the amount of rice that would feed one person for one year. So it's a shit ton of rice, but... Uh, Theoretically, his income was enough to feed 4,200 people for a full year, so. But, you know, that aside, he probably wasn't paid in rice. He was probably paid in coin equating to 4,200 koku. And also, since he didn't face the sort of expenses the visiting daimyo did, he was really doing pretty damn good financially. His position in the court was master of courtly ceremony, and before that, he was a representative of the fourth shogun, Ietsuna. So he was well-known, he had a respectable pedigree and a respectable work history, 
And on top of that, his son was married to the sister of the son-in-law of the shogun, Tsunayoshi, in 1678. So he had a lot of connections. He was well-connected and well-liked, apparently. By the time of the incident, Kira had been emceeing for the court for about 40 years, and it was in this capacity that Asano Naganori and Date Muneharu were assigned to him. All right, so now that we have a little bit of background on the two main players here, let's get to the actual attack itself. So the attack on Kira by Asano took place, uh, like I said, on the 14th day of the third month of the Japanese lunar calendar, which was the 14th year of Gendoku. That's the period name. Uh, But in our Western modern calendar, that would be April 17th, 1701. And it took place in the Corridor of Pines in Edo Castle. It was called the Corridor of Pines because there were apparently pine trees painted on the walls, which is neither here nor there. But, you know, the corridor is mentioned in sources as the Pine Corridor. So that's what it's referring to, in case you were wondering. And the attack itself happened during preparations for a ceremony for envoys of the emperor. Before I go on, you might be thinking, well, Asano had no way of knowing the consequences of his actions or something along those lines. Not true. 20 years before, his very own uncle killed a daimyo by the name of Nagai Hisanaga in Edo during the funeral of the fourth shogun, Ietsuna. It was revenge for some slight, but the new shogun, Tsuneyoshi, had him killed and confiscated his lands as well. So Asano would have known how tough Tsuneyoshi was, and even then he still attacked Kira. So he would have knowingly put all of his retainers in jeopardy by attacking Kira. So it seems to me that Asano was probably not very forward-thinking, In fact, if you want to get all Bushido on his ass, you should argue that putting petty revenge for some perceived slight by Kira above the welfare of his domain and all of his vassals was a very un-samurai thing to do, and totally not a Confucian thing to do. Asano essentially failed completely as a daimyo with his actions, and I think from a Confucian standpoint, what he did was completely unforgivable. Despite Asano's actions and how you judge him, Different philosophical rules governed the actions of the ronin, so even if Asano was a miserable failure based on Confucian principles, the ronin's actions had to be judged by other rules, and I'll get into that later on in the next episode of the podcast. So anyway, like I mentioned, the attack happened during preparations for a ceremony for envoys of the emperor, and luckily for us, there was actually an eyewitness to Asano's attack, Kajikawa Yosobe Yoriteru, a supervisory official who was on duty for the ceremony. And just a quick note here, for anyone who's read Turnbull's book on the 47 Ronin, I just wanted to point out that uh, he calls him Kajiwara Yasube Yoriteru, but all the other sources that I find called him Kajikawa rather than Kajiwara. So that's what I'm going with. Also, by the way, as far as the ceremony was concerned, this wasn't just any old shogunal ceremony. This was for the imperial representatives of the emperor, known as the Ceremony of Response to the Emperor, which was a ceremony to offer thanks to the imperial greeting. And it was a yearly thing, and it was kind of a big deal. On top of that, Kira was in charge of this ceremony, so Asano's shitty conduct could have caused a serious mess for everyone, but it seems that the ceremony itself went on and everyone was pretty much none the wiser. But anyway, according to the eyewitness Kajikawa Yoriteru, the timing of the gift-giving for the imperial envoys was moved up, and so when he went looking for Kira to confirm this, he wasn't able to find him. So he summoned Asano Naganori instead and asked him for assistance, and Asano agreed to help him. At this time, Kira appeared, and while Kajikawa was talking to him about the details of the ceremony, Asano came up behind him with his short sword drawn. And I should note that katanas were not allowed in the palace, so he would have only had his short sword, which he swung at Kira, yelling, Have you forgotten my recent grievance? Which in a Monumenta Nipponica article that I found by Bito Masahide is quoted as, Kono eda no ikon, oboetaru ka? For anyone who is curious, Asano struck Kira twice before he was tackled and subdued by Kajikawa. Kajikawa then handed Asano over to the Metsuke, sort of a, a police detective or a palace detect- a palace officer, you could, I guess you could say, a lawman. And that was it. Asano was confined to the Willow Room, which, based on precedent, I'll have to assume that there was a willow painted on the wall. And according to sources, Asano never said what his grievance was. He simply stated that he had no choice but to strike out against Kira, but he didn't say why. So there are a few things of note here. First off, Unlike the story, there really isn't any indication that Kira's hat deflected a blow to save him, like the story says. And, in fact, the eyewitness report shows that Kira was struck twice with a wakizashi, which is still a pretty hefty weapon, even if it isn't a katana. And it's razor sharp. But I guess my point here, and one that is commented on by the contemporary commentators, is that Asano was apparently so inept with a sword that he couldn't kill an unarmed old man in a surprise attack with two good swings. 
Then apparently a satiric verse went around that made fun of Asuno for not knowing enough to stab rather than slash with a short sword. After Asuno was taken into custody, and apparently after his stint in the Willow Room, he was confined at the mansion of the daimyo Tamura Takeaki, where he had a message sent to his retainers at Ako Castle and in Edo informing them of what had happened, although he made no mention of specifically why he attacked Kira. Asuno never mentioned it while he was in custody, and apparently never told his retainers. So we don't know why he attacked Kira. We really don't. The best we have is Asuno's statement after the fact quoted by Bito Masahide, where he said, I have had a grudge against Kira for some time, and although I much regret the time and place, I had no choice but to strike at him. And sure, the, the common narrative is that Kira was corrupt and greedy and treated him terribly, but that's pretty much just speculation. We just don't know. There are two theories, but that's about all they are, theories. One is, like I mentioned, that Asuno didn't provide enough money and gifts to Kira to satisfy his greed. And the other theory is that Kira was simply annoyed with the unskilled and uncultured Asuno and belittled him either out of malice or basically just exasperation that Asuno was too dense to understand his instructions. But we really don't know. But we know which theory makes for a better story, right? So when it comes to the fictionalized version, the better story is always won out. Anyway, there isn't even a reason mentioned by any of the 47 Ronin in all of their correspondence as to why Asuno attacked Kira. If it was a clear case of greedy Kira pushing Asuno over the edge, I feel like that would have been mentioned at some point, if for no other reason than as a justification. But the Ronin never made mention of the reason for Asuno's attack, only that they were finishing it for him. And I suppose technically from a, a Bushido standpoint, the reasons don't matter. Your lord was wronged or he was unable to complete his attack, and so the vassals complete it for him. But while I'm on the subject of Kira, I think it should be pointed out also that there really is no indication of malfeasance, greed, or corruption on the part of Kira that we know of. That's just pure speculation. Granted, if Kira was a corrupt official, he wouldn't exactly advertise it, but the Bakufu seems pretty good at getting dirt on people. I'm sure you remember what they were able to dig up on Asuno in his own castle in another domain. So I don't think it would be unreasonable for them to be aware of the malfeasance of one of their own officials in Edo Palace if it were true. In 1744, Motori Norinaga wrote down what he said was a tale told to him by a monk at a temple, pretty much all hearsay and probably for entertainment, which includes the story that Kira was corrupt and greedy. So this idea has been long established, although not actually supported in reality as far as we know. Also, I want to mention, there's no indication that Date Muneharu had any ill will towards Kira at any point. That seems to be a fictionalized literary flourish to show just how far Asuno truly had to be pushed to actually attack Kira. As another aside, other versions of the story tell that Date was just so inept that he lavished gifts on Kira himself in order to gain his favor and get the best instruction possible so that he didn't make a fool of himself. And Date Muneharu was otherwise known as Kame, and that's how you see him referred to in a lot of the fictionalized versions of the 47 Ronin, in case anyone's confused here. But anyway, the whole idea that Kira was a bad guy is questionable, or at least if it was a possibility, there just isn't any actual evidence to back it up. And one of the reasons for no evidence, and the main reason why we don't know Asano's motivation, aside from the fact that he didn't mention it, is because the officials had him executed the same day. No hearing, no tribunal, or, or whatever Edo officials do. Just, here's the knife. So in reality, less than eight hours passed between the attack on Kira and Asano's seppuku. The basic timeline went like this. The attack happened at some point before noon, and Asano was remanded to the custody of Tamura Takeaki around 1 p.m., the decision to have him commit seppuku was delivered around 4 p.m., and he killed himself around 6 p.m. And for all you conspiracy nuts out there, I know what you're thinking, but just because the seppuku happened so soon, don't assume that it's because of anything that Kira did, or because he used his influence to terminate Asuno and sweep the whole event under the rug, or anything like that. The reasons were a lot simpler. Like I mentioned, the attack happened during a ceremony for envoys of the emperor, Higashiyama. And the fact that the attack happened during the ceremony showed extreme disrespect for the emperor, and the shogun was not having that. He basically had to send a message to the country and to the emperor that this behavior would not be tolerated. Although, despite this, apparently the emperor felt that Asano's attack confirmed the court's beliefs about the samurai, that they were uncultured animals. So maybe shogun Tsunoshi's quick handling of the situation still didn't quite help the emperor's opinion. But the shogun did what was required in the situation. But Tsunuyoshi's handling of the situation was kind of a big deal. Killing a daimyo and confiscating his lands would obviously have shitty consequences for everyone in his domain, and did have dire consequences. Asano Naganori's heir, his younger brother Asano Nagahiro, also known as Daigaku, 
was immediately placed under house arrest in Edo and eventually shipped off to the main Asano branch in Hiroshima. And suddenly, 270 direct retainers, and probably more when you count the employed labor, the floor sweepers and sandal bearers and so on, were potentially to find themselves out of a job, if not outright homeless. All thanks to what can only be described as a dumb decision by Asano Naganori. Within a day of Asano's death, the Bakufu dispatched officials to take possession of Ako Castle, and former Asano retainers started making their way back to Ako from Edo. And all remaining Asano retainers were given three days to vacate the Edo mansion and hit the bricks. Very nice. Thank you very much. Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? Contrary to popular belief, a revenge plot was not the immediate reaction of the majority of Ronin. There was an argument for it up front by Horibe Akizane, who at age 76 would be the oldest of the 47 ronin. But he was 76 in medieval times, and with that kind of health care, he was probably already one foot in the grave anyway, so what did he have to lose? But he was joined by Okuda Magudayu and Takada Gunbei in the argument for revenge against Kira. So there were a few. Although I should mention here that Takada Gunbei eventually gave up on the idea of revenge and was not one of the final 47 ronin. Now here's an interesting tidbit. Guess who argued against revenge? Yep, that's right. Good old Oishi Kuranosuke. He basically did all he could to get Naganori's younger brother out of house arrest and appoint a daimyo. He sent petitions to the Bakufu and went so far as to essentially prostrate himself in front of the Bakufu via letter, stating that they had assumed that Kira had been killed by Asano, but since this was not the case, as backwards country samurai, they couldn't understand why Kira wasn't punished equally under the established principle of dual fault and that they'd be forced to hole up in Akko Castle unless something was done about it. And of course, nothing was done about it, but also Kurenosuke didn't follow through with his plan to hold the castle against the shogunate. It seems to be just some sort of a stopgap measure to buy some time and hopefully get some concessions out of the Bakufu. But when that didn't work, they peacefully vacated the castle, apparently because Oishi thought that any further action against the Bakufu could jeopardize Asano's younger brother being restored as the head of the Asano clan. And that seems to be Oishi's ultimate goal, to get his old job back. For the record, Asano's younger brother was pardoned in 1709, a good seven years after Kira was killed. But in point of fact, scholars now pretty much agree that the Bakufu couldn't have appointed Asano's younger brother Nagahiro as head of the clan anyway, because that would be breaking with the long-established precedent of completely removing offending houses. And on top of that, allowing Asano's younger brother to take over the clan at the request of Oishi could have even been considered a tacit admission that they were wrong in condemning Asano Naganori to death in the first place. And there's no evidence that anyone aside from Oishi and the rest actually had any problem with how Asano's situation had been handled at Edo Castle. On the subject of Kira's punishment in the matter, or I should say, lack of punishment, in a way, Oishi and the rest did have a valid point. In almost all similar cases, both the attacker and the attackee were punished, assuming the person attacked even survived at all. I mentioned the principle of dual fault. There was a rule on the books called Kenka Ryosebai, or dual fault in a fight which meant that anyone involved in a fight would be punished. But in Kira's case, they not only didn't punish him, but they even sympathized with him. The reasons for this given is that Kira didn't lift a finger to defend himself. He didn't reach for his short sword, let alone draw it, according to Kajikawa. So basically he did his duty in not engaging, and so he was let off. And I'm sure him crying like a little girl who dropped her ice cream probably didn't hurt his case. Just kidding. He, he might not have cried, but... Uh, Part of the justification seems to have been that it was a one-sided attack and not actually a fight. And Bito Masahide argues that this is an indication of Shogun Tsuneyoshi's focus on preserving order rather than honor. And this apparently didn't go over well with run-of-the-mill samurai. But regardless, I I think in a way the fact that Kira failed to even attempt to defend himself might have irked the ronin as much as him not getting punished. After all, how could a true samurai allow himself to be attacked and not even attempt to defend himself? I'm guessing it probably increased their disdain for him. Another idea that came up by the ronin was the idea of a mass seppuku, to protest Asano's death. But by the letter of the law, this would have counted as junshi, and so they gave up on the idea. Now, if you don't know the details of junshi, definitely check out the first Tales of the Samurai episode on samurai suicide, where I go into great detail. But the short version is that junshi is a form of seppuku where you follow your lord to the grave. And the reason the ronin gave up on that idea is because junshi had been outlawed and would have dire consequences for their surviving family members. So, you know, sort of a cop-out on one hand, but on the other hand, it does show better decision-making among the ronin than Asano displayed, so there's that. But the ronin waffled and debated on what to do for quite a while. The fictionalized version would have you believe that Oishi Kuranosuke gathered up 46 like-minded ronin within days of Asano's death and immediately began planning revenge. Not true. Like I said, 
Kurnosuke argued against revenge and did all he could to first get Asuno's brother appointed to Akko so that they could continue as employed samurai. And only when every other avenue had been exhausted, that's when revenge went on the table for Kurenosuke. And even then, the true motivation isn't clear. I mean, you'd think it's straightforward. Well, our lord was unfairly punished, and it's because of Kira, so we must uphold our duty as samurai and attack him and kill him on behalf of our lord. But it's really not that clear cut. In fact, there are, there are a few theories here. One theory here is that the result of the revenge plot was that they hoped they'd all be held up as such paragons of Bushido that another willing daimyo would take them on as samurai. It's just a theory, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. And I feel like there's probably precedent for it, although I don't have anything off the top of my head. But at this point anyway, when there were no other options but to, I don't know, go make umbrellas or whatever poor unemployed ronin do, did they really feel it was their duty to go out and get revenge on behalf of their lord? It's mostly a rhetorical question because we really don't know. But if you look at the timeline and realize how they tried pretty much everything aside from revenge or seppuku, you really have to wonder if honorable vengeance was really the core motivator at this point. It could be argued that in trying to get Asano's younger brother appointed to head of the clan, that they were trying to preserve the Asano house, which is commendable. And since Kuranosuke was Asano's chief retainer, it's understandable. But you could also argue that they were simply trying to preserve their livelihoods, which is maybe not quite so commendable, but it's understandable. Now, contrast that with the idea of revenge. In attempting immediate revenge, they gave up on any chance of helping Asano's younger brother take his position as the head of the clan. They definitely lose their livelihood and probably end up dead in the process, or at least as a result of their actions. So I guess, I guess my point is here, these two things are just not compatible. This is part of what I want to get into in the next podcast episode on the punishment side of the 47 Ronin. I want to look at the sort of the philosophy, the Confucian and other philosophies that were used in the debate on, on their actions. But on the one hand, you have loyalty to the Asano house, which is shown by trying to preserve the house and trying to get Asano's younger brother installed as head. But on the other hand, you have loyalty to Asano himself. And so in a way, if the Ronin had succeeded in getting Asano's younger brother appointed and had smoothed things over with the Bakafu, they'd be sacrificing the idea of revenge, sort of the Bushido samurai ideal. They wouldn't be following through with their duty to their lord. And on the other hand, in taking revenge, they'd be failing the Confucian ideals of responsibility to the clan. So it's almost like some sort of a battle between Confucianism and Zen or maybe Bushido. I'm not really sure, but like I said, next episode I plan to get more into this and suffice it to say, it was a complex situation and Edo period scholars also had a tough time with it, so I guess we're in good company. And they went back and forth for centuries debating it. But it's a complex issue and it must have been a series of tough decisions for the Ronin. Even if, when all is said and done, they took revenge on Kira out of pure loyalty to Asano, nothing happens in a vacuum. And I can sit here in the Samurai Archive studio with a microphone in front of me 300 years after the fact and prognosticate all I want over a glass of whiskey, but the reality must have been that it was a messy and tough decision. And like we've said a million times in past episodes, the Samurai didn't follow Bushido. It wasn't an ideology that gave them answers to every specific question. They just kind of lived their lives and Bushido was just kind of... Anyway, go listen to the episode where we shit on Bushido because that'll kind of explain things. So it really wouldn't have been a clear-cut decision for them. I mean, would it be for you? What would you do in that situation? What would I do? What would I do? Our petition to get our lord's younger brother Nagahiro appointed as head of the clan has failed. He has been confined to the main branch of the Asano family in Hiroshima. <sighs> well, shit, I guess we better work on our umbrella making skills. We were thinking we'd kill Kira instead, and after presenting his head at our lord's grave, we'll all cut our stomachs together. Oh, sure, that sounds like a... wait, what? Well, regardless of the motivation of the Ronin, they came to the decision to exact revenge and Oishi Kurnosuke took the lead. Even if he was against revenge at first. Even if he did everything possible to avoid it. And, you know, another thing I should mention here is that maybe 15% of Asano's samurai actually thought that revenge on Kira was a good idea. So if you're not sure what that means, let me tell you. It's a landslide vote against revenge. If the vast majority of Asano's samurai were against revenge, that kind of seems to indicate to me that it was maybe not the most appropriate response to the situation. You'd think that if this type of situation was expected, or even appropriate, Oishi would have gotten way more people on board with the idea. But he didn't, so ponder that. So moving on, once the castle was relinquished and they lost the domain, that's the point where they began plotting. Although I should actually say, 
we don't really know at what point they started plotting, and I'll, I'll get to that. But we also don't know the true motivation behind the plotting. Was it purely to regain their lord's lost honor, or were they just trying to impress some other daimyo with their loyalty in order to secure employment after the revenge was completed? We don't know. Uh, to be fair, we have to give both options equal weight. I mean, I could sit here and argue that Occam's Razor says that they were probably trying to impress someone, but, you know, there's no way of knowing. But I mean, from our modern point of view, that's really the m most reasonable explanation, I think. But on the other hand, they could have gone looking for employment elsewhere. I mean, obviously, many did. In fact, the vast majority did, because in the end, only 47 men out of 270 were left to carry out the plot. I mean, all the rest pretty much went on into mundane obscurity. So I guess that's just one of history's mysteries. And at the same time, it also shows that either the remaining ronin who didn't join up with the 47 either had no idea what was going on or kept the plot to themselves. And other ronin who dropped out of the plot before the actual raid also never said a word, since it seems that no one in any bakufu capacity or Kira's spies ever caught on. So that's, that's pretty impressive. And, you know, like I just said, and talking about mysteries, we really don't know what went on between when they left Akko Castle in the fourth month of 1701 and the 10th month of 1702, when the remaining Ronin moved to Edo. I mean, that's a good 18-month gap. Uh, sure, we have accounts of a drunken Kuranosuke and Yamashina and others divorcing wives and leaving children to join the plot to kill Kira, but apparently a lot of this comes from fictionalized sources. Now I'm going to do some armchair history now, and this just kind of occurred to me. I haven't actually seen this theory out there, but this is just my thought. Asano's younger brother was under house arrest in Edo until the 7th month of 1702. Nothing was really happening with him. But suddenly, in the seventh month of 1702, he was sent into custody of the Hiroshima branch of the Asano clan. So symbolically, this could be considered the final statement by the Bakufu that he was not going to be appointed head of the Akko Asano house. This could have been considered the final nail in the coffin of the Asano house in Akko and Oishi's chances at getting his old job back. And this is just conjecture, but a mere three months later, after Asano's younger brother was sent to Hiroshima, this is when the Ronin officially started plotting revenge in Edo. And like I said, we don't know what they were doing for the past 18 months. They might have just been lying low hoping something would happen with Asano Nagahiro. And when he was sent off to Hiroshima, now they had nothing left. And it wasn't even until this point that they decided to take revenge on Kira officially. But what we do know is that the 47 Ronin, ostensibly led by Oishi Kuranosuke, laid low and plotted revenge for some unspecified amount of time during the time between giving up the castle and moving to Edo in the 10th month of 1702. I mean, we don't even know when the, the true plotting started. There, there's really no indication. As far as we know, the only officially proven point in the timeline is when they moved to Edo in the 10th month. But anyway, that's when they came to Edo to prep for the nuts and bolts of the attack. And there are various fictionalized versions of how the Ronin learned the layout of Kira's mansion, everything from one of the Ronin becoming a disciple to Kira's favorite tea master, to another Ronin marrying the daughter of the mansion architect, it seems we don't really know how this information was really gathered, but somehow they got their hands on it. And in the days and weeks leading up to the final attack on Kira's mansion, various Ronin wrote farewell letters to family members and generally got their affairs in order. So again, despite the fact that they're sending out goodbye letters, and, which means it should have been obvious to their family what was going on, word never seemed to get back to the Bakufu or to Kira's spies. So I find that, in, I, again, I find that interesting. But at this point, Pretty much as the story goes, Oishi Kuranosuke planned to divide the ronin up into two groups, one going in by the front gate and the other going through the back gate. Both gates were on opposite sides of the compound. As they entered the compound, ronin would remain to secure an area. This included nailing shut the doors of the barracks to keep the Ashigaru from defending the mansion. So unlike the story, the reality was they didn't have to contend with all of Kira's troops because they had actually barricaded them inside the barracks. So it becomes a little bit less of an epic battle than the fiction leads you to believe. But anyway, Kuranosuke would also set up archers to shoot down anyone trying to get help, and the rest of the ronin would move on until two small groups would enter the mansion via opposite sides and hunt for Kira. So if you follow the sort of the setup there. The first group was led by Kuranosuke, and the second group entering from the other side of the compound was led by Yoshida Kanesuke, and actually not by Kuranosuke's son, like in the fictionalized version although he was with Yoshida Kanesuke. So in total, you have 24 via the front gate, including Terasaka Kichiemon, and then 23 ronin via the back gate. So the total is 47 ronin. That's where that number comes from. And they also did a lot of contingency planning. So if the mansion was surrounded while they were in there, they would barricade themselves in until they killed Kira. If troops showed up after they killed Kira, they would give no resistance and wait for the authorities. And if no one got in the way, 
they'd meet at the Echoin Temple. But if they were refused entry to the temple, they would meet at the Ryogoku Bridge and then set off for Sengakuji Temple where Asuna was buried. And finally, if they just plain failed altogether and never got Kira, they would all just commit seppuku at Kira's mansion. So they pretty much had all their bases covered. And to go over the command structure for a second, like I said, Kuranosuke led one group and Kanesuke led the other group. Each of them had two subordinates who assisted in command. Kuranosuke had Hara Mototoki and Maseki Yudayu, and Yoshida Kanesuke had Onodera Hidekazu and Hazama Mitsunobu. And like I mentioned, Kuranosuke's son was part of the second group under Kanesuke, but he wasn't placed in a command position. The attack signal would be Kuranosuke's drum, and the signal that Kira had been found would be a whistle. Once Kira was found, they'd blow the whistle, make an identification, and then the plan was to behead him and place his severed head in front of Asuno's tomb at Sengakuji Temple. So part of the planning wasn't to ask Kira to commit seppuku as far as I know. It seems that they were basically just headhunting. So there's a bit of a diversion from the fictionalized version. But after this, they turn themselves in. Simple. Now at this point, when the raid is about to begin, we don't really know a lot of detail about exactly how it all went down, but it seems to match up more or less with the fictionalized version, with the exception that there are a lot of questions surrounding the location of Terasaka Kichiemon once the gates of the compound were broken in. Also, it's worth mentioning that Hara Mototoki fell off a ladder while trying to sneak into the compound and was injured. And interestingly, this was apparently the only real injury reported. So, suffice it to say, everything went without a hitch aside from the poor bastard who fell off a ladder, but Kira was found in a storehouse on the property, his head was taken, the end result on the Kira side was that his son was severely wounded and 37 of his men were also dead or wounded. Turnbull has a theoretical map of how it all played out in his book, The Revenge of the 47 Ronin. Appropriate title. But it's worth a look, so I won't bother with it here, since it's basically an educated guess. It's really not. Uh, we we're, There's really no evidence to specifically back up what really happened. But So the rest also essentially follows the story. 44 of the 47 ronin headed to the Sengakuji Temple after gathering at Ryogoku Bridge. They had been denied entrance at the Ekuin Temple, apparently because the monks were worried that the ronin would cut their stomachs there. And, you know, 44 cut stomachs is a hell of a mess to deal with, so I get it. And the reason only 44 of the 47 actually headed to the temple is because Terasaka Kichiemon was just gone for some reason, and Yoshida Kanesuke and Tomimori Masayori were sent to deliver a written statement of their revenge to a Bakafu official. Now, as the 44 ronin made their way to Sengakuji Temple, they were apparently quite worried about being attacked on the way, so they took a very defensive route to the temple, and... It wasn't the triumphant parade that the fiction would make it out to be. There were no high fives and complimentary breakfasts or anything like that. Uh, it seems like they did all they could to avoid any contact with anyone in case the Wesugi caught wind of it and came after them. But once the remaining ronin arrived at Sengakuji Temple, they plopped Kira's head down in front of Asano's tomb and offered up incense for their now avenged lord. So that, that pretty much went the way the story does. And Kira's head was apparently returned to his family by the monks of the temple and cremated with the rest of his remains. Now, at this point of the uh, story here, Yoshida and Tomimori reported to the Bakufu official Sengoku Hisono and handed him the written statement. The statement, uh, you know, we avenged our lord, we killed Kira, these are the 47 involved. So Sengoku dispatched officials to the Sengakuji temple to gather the ronin, where it turns out there were only 44. All of the ronin, minus Yoshida and Tomomori, obviously, but Terasaka was also missing. When the ronin were taken into custody, they were separated into four groups. So at this point, we're now officially left with 46 ronin, with Terasaka missing for whatever reason, and the ronin were split up into four groups and held at different daimyo mansions around Edo while their fate was debated. Unlike the story, the sentence of seppuku was not immediately handed down. Debate lasted uh, up probably a little over a month and a half, after which they were sentenced to die by seppuku for disturbing the peace and for conspiracy. I'll get into this more in next episode, but interestingly, they weren't being punished for the actual attack on Kira's mansion. At this point, that's how it all seems to have gone down in reality, and next episode I'll go deep into the philosophical arguments about the righteousness or criminality of the whole revenge plot, and focus on the punishment of the 46 ronin, and also the philosophical debates involved in that entire process. I also plan to release some bonus audio content for the patrons on Patreon about the 47 ronin after that, so... If you're interested, there's another reason to check out patreon.com slash Samurai Archives. But that's it for this episode. So you can find Samurai Archives on Facebook. Just do a search and you'll find it. Pretty straightforward. Also, follow the podcast on Twitter at Samurai Archives. I'll keep you up to date on what's going on in the world of Samurai Archives and 
the world in general in regards to Japanese history. And be sure to check out SamuraiPodcast.com for a list of the sources used for this episode and for all the ways you can support the podcast. And I also want to mention that the Samurai Archive shop now has some podcast gear, t-shirts and coffee cups and stuff like that. So be sure to check that out. And I believe it is CafePress.com slash Samurai Archives, but also ShopSamurai.com will get you there as well. And again, if you like what you hear and you want to help out and get early access to new episodes, access to bonus content and so forth, head over to Patreon.com slash Samurai Archives. We don't have any sort of ads or ad revenue or anything like that. We're 100% listener supported and I kind of prefer to keep it that way. So if you're willing and able and you can afford even even a mere meager dollar an episode helps out and it's very appreciated. You know, like I've said, it's the thanks to the Patreon people that I've been able to sort of get the motivation and drive to get these episodes done. And we're almost to our next Patreon goal. So let's see if we can make that push and make that happen with this episode. But that's all I got. So special thanks to all the various people who helped me out with various aspects of this over at the forum. I asked a few questions, got a few good answers. And so that was very helpful. I also want to give a shout out to Patreon supporter Luis. You can find him on Twitter at Analysis of Thrones. So give him a follow. And thanks for your support. That's it. Hey Yoshi, more whiskey.